Barbara Jeffress, author, dramatist, critic, feminist and lifelong activist for the rights of Australian writers. Barbara is remembered not only for her keen attention to the lives of women in her novels and short stories, but also for her enduring service to other writers through her advocacy and work at the Australian Society of Authors. Established in honour of her legacy from a bequest made by her husband, the late John Hind, we present the Barbara Jeffress Award. Good evening, I'm Bree Lee and I'm delighted to be coming to you tonight from Gadigal Land in Sydney. I'll be your MC as we celebrate the 2020 Barbara Jeffress Award in this first ever online winner announcement. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and we extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us this evening. In an event that is particularly about storytelling and identity, it is important that we remember the false narratives upon which this new government was developed. Sovereignty was never ceded and there has still been no treaty. I encourage you, wherever you are this evening, to reflect upon the history and the people who have been here walking these lands for 60,000 plus years before the rest of us. The award was created in honour of Barbara Jeffress. Since 2008, it has been offered to Australian authors of novels that depict women and girls in a positive way, or which empower the status of women in society. As part of my emceeing duties, I've been asked to make some opening remarks, sharing my thoughts about the representation of women in literature. It's 2020. We've arrived at that almost fabled year of the future, but it feels like this award and awards like it are more important than ever. Almost a century ago, Virginia Woolf was asked to opine on a similar topic, hers being women and fiction, and the result was A Room of One's Own, a book that is still being read and read and shared and adapted now. One of the two winners of this prize from 2014, Margot Lanigan, told the Sydney Morning Herald that year that rights tend to slip away when we aren't vigilant. A woman's prize is as vital now as it ever was. If we bring the central concerns from a room of one's own to mind right now that a woman needs a lockable room and some money of her own to write, the glaring problem I'm seeing is how extraordinarily gendered both the issues and responses to COVID-19 have been. Even the treasurer himself has acknowledged that the recovery plans and budgets continue to disproportionately benefit men. And women's careers and creative capacities continue to suffer disproportionately with children home from school because men still refuse to do 50%. I'm interested in the overlaps between how women are silenced or disregarded in literature and then in life more generally. Nowhere is it more obvious that a woman's life is so often defined by her relations to men than when she has passed away and people are attempting to find words to communicate the value that she had or offered. In obituaries, women are wives of men, daughters of fathers and mothers of sons. They are thanked for their homemaking skills with a gratitude that was unlikely ever shown them when they were still alive. Researching for this speech made me realize that obituaries really force people to find words to articulate how they think about women in general, as well as the specific woman they're supposed to be writing about. A few years ago, somebody did the numbers and they showed that in the New York Times, women only represent about 10% of the obituaries that are even written. And even though we care so much about what women look like, women are only one in 10 times as likely to have a photo run beside the writing of their obituaries. I believe the problem of obituaries and the way women are often written about and remembered is offensive also because of the way we just don't like older women. The extreme disrespect and silencing of older women by our culture and our cultural products is so blatant. Anything unfuckable and anything no longer capable of reproducing is disregarded and silenced. It is invisibilized. The other joint winner of this prize from 2014, Fiona McFarlane, wrote The Night Guest, which challenged the taboo around the sexual pleasure of older women. A 75-year-old woman experiencing arousal and romance is unfortunately still a concept rare even in literary fiction let alone a common concept in cultural and wider media and cultural products. 
The overlapping factor here, of course, as well, is motherhood. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Women writers won't have rooms of their own until we have equal, use it or lose it, paid parental leave. That's a simple economic fact. But also, more deeply, our media and our storytelling continues to make either Madonnas or Medeas out of all of the mothers. The winner of this prize in 2016, Peggy Frew, wrote Hope Farm, set against the background of an alternative way of living. In a commune, she explored the parent-child relationship being tested. What do we make of a woman who has given birth but refuses to play the mummy role? Our little brains go into error mode. It is gendered biological determinism that we don't demand men undergo the same annihilation of the inner self upon becoming fathers. What I like about this award is that it's not just about celebrating the stories of good women or admirable women. We've moved on past that. In 2018, Libby Angel won this award for her novel, The Trapeze Act. Head judge described the matriarch protagonist in The Trapeze Act by saying, she's quite awful, in fact, a terrible mother, but she is just so full of energy and so brave and she forces her daughter to be brave. Helen Garner won this award the second time it was ever given, in 2009, for her autofictional novel, The Spare Room, in which the protagonist, Helen, is so furious and disappointed and impatient with her friend who is dying of cancer. Garner said in an interview, I was surprised and appalled to discover that the feelings you have when you're looking after a dying person are not at all the kind of fantasized Florence Nightingale things you might hope for but there can often be a very dark, semi-conscious struggle and you find in yourself emotions that are ugly and frighten you and fill you with shame. I felt I couldn't be the only person who knew those feelings. The common thread amongst all of these issues, I believe, is that so long as you are ascribing things to and categorizing women, you are denying the complexity of their humanity. When girls are children up until the moment that they become sex objects, not allowed a safe adolescence, you deny them their humanity. When women of color are exoticized and made animals and things that can be conquered, you are denying them their humanity. When mothers are either good or bad, depending purely on how self-sacrificial they are, you are denying their humanity. When older women are invisibilized or silenced and disregarded because either you don't find them sexy anymore or they can't bear you sons, you are denying their humanity. And if a work of literature cannot capture something of humanity, then it's just not good. It is our responsibility as writers and readers and publishers and booksellers to say to any writer who either doesn't get, let alone doesn't really like women, not good enough. Not good enough for our awards, not good enough for our lists, not good enough, most importantly, for any single one of us to have to spend at least a dozen of our precious hours of our lives reading. Fortunately, at times like this, on wonderful evenings like this, as writers, readers, publishers and booksellers, it is also our pleasure and privilege to celebrate and elevate the books that do such good work examining this humanity and are therefore of the highest quality. I offer my heartfelt admiration and congratulations to all of the authors shortlisted tonight. And I extend that gratitude to the publishers, booksellers, and all of the readers who are spreading the word about the authors and books on this list. With our powers combined, we can honor and acknowledge the complex humanities of all women. And now to the official proceedings. I'd like to start by thanking our judging panel for this year's Barbara Jeffress Award. Dr. Robin Sheehan Bright, widely published, award-winning author, inaugural director of the Queensland Writers' Centre and text writing and publishing consultant since 1997. Dr. Jeremy Fisher, OAM, author, adjunct senior lecturer in writing at the University of New England and Order of Australia medal recipient for his services to literature, education and professional organisations. Barbara Horgan, Perth-based former bookseller and co-owner of Shearer's Bookshops. The judges were particularly challenged by the task of judging two years of publications, where any one year in Australian publishing yields such treasures. Nevertheless, after much deliberation, the judges settled on five outstanding works for the shortlist. 
The White Girl by Tony Birch, University of Queensland Press. Hi, my name's Tony Birch. My novel, The White Girl, is um, about the relationship between an Aboriginal grandmother, Odette Brown, and her granddaughter, Sissy. And the novel really is, in the end, about the ability of Aboriginal people to confront the ravages of colonialism and confront the hypocrisies of identity legislation and survive as Aboriginal families and Aboriginal communities. Too Much Lip by Melissa Lukashenko, University of Queensland Press. I wrote Too Much Lip uh, because I wanted to talk about class and race and gender. But I wanted to bring in a really kick-ass female character, a protagonist who roars across the New South Wales border on a stolen Harley Davidson because um, I felt that this historical moment needed an Aboriginal woman who was queer and bold and didn't really care a lot for the white man's laws uh, to carry this story about trauma, how the way trauma uh, works its way out in Aboriginal families. There was still love by Favel Parrott, Hachette, Australia. I wrote this novel to be with my grandparents again and to learn more about their lives. I really wanted to honour them and for people to hear their story. I also wanted to honour all the grandmothers of Eastern Europe that sacrificed so much to keep the next generation and their grandkids safe. They're really the heroines of that time um, and I wanted their story to be told. Wolf Island by Lucy Trelaw, Pan Macmillan, Australia. Wolf Island is about Kitty Hawke, the sole remaining inhabitant of an island in the Chesapeake Bay. But one day her granddaughter Kat and some friends arrive. They're desperately seeking sanctuary and Kitty takes them in. Kitty in a way represents all of us. Uh, she's watching slightly that kind of dangerous world outside. Um, but it isn't until it comes right to her door that she is forced to take action. The Yield by Tara June Winch, Penguin Random House, Australia. It's a novel about a lot of things. I keep saying that there's no elevator pitch for this book and I think it's true. Perhaps it's about ourselves as Australians, about our true black history. As judges of the ASA's Barbara Jeffress Award, we were conscious of the contributions made by Barbara as both writer and advocate for writers. As a staunch feminist, she would have been pleased to discover the many strong women featured in these titles. We were very much struck by the empathy with which the experiences of older women were depicted as powerful role models, and also by the titles in which the experiences of children and young adults were artfully and subtly traced. Despite the many contemporary concerns reflected in them, such serious issues were often leavened by an exuberant sense of humour. We settled, though, on five outstanding works to shortlist. Tony Birch's The White Girl details the experiences of the stolen generations via the prism of the life of 63-year-old Odette Brown. This powerful novel is a compelling account of the injustices inflicted upon Aboriginal people a calm and compassionate fictional reenactment of their many testimonies. This is a real story of great depth, which skillfully ends on a note of love and hopefulness. Tony Birch's achingly beautiful writing and artfully yet simply told story have the quality of a timeless work of fiction. In Melissa Lukashenko's Too Much Lip, three overlapping stories about former boxer Owen Addison his wise-cracking granddaughter, Kerry Salter, and street-savvy real estate agent, Martina Rossi, merge when Kerry arrives home in Durango, in Bunjalung country, to say goodbye to her ailing pop. Melissa Lukashenko's command of visual language is enhanced by her provocative humour. She delivers uncomfortable and confronting truths about Indigenous relationships in contemporary Australia, but nevertheless offers redemption and forgiveness where neither might have seemed possible. Favelle Parrott's There Was Still Love is a mesmerisingly haunting tale 
about a Czechoslovakian family separated by war, told via the reflections of two grandchildren, Mala Liska in Melbourne and Ludek in Prague, interspersed with the fractured family history of their twin grandmothers, Eva and Manya, born in Prague in 1921. The author's empathy with the political and emotional background to their complicated grief is redolent with loss. But despite all the pain, there was still love. Lucy Trelaw's Wolf Island is a magnificent novel set on a sinking island in Nantucket. Kitty Hawke's attachment to this place as woman and artist has caused her to live apart from her family. Her encounters during her epic journey north to the border were reminiscent of any classical everyman's journey. This powerful work celebrates the fortitude of the central female character and the strength she gains from enduring both personal loss and being forced to take responsibility for both family members and strangers. Trelaw's writing is epic in its power. In Tara June Winch's The Yield, Auguste Gundawindi's narrative is juxtaposed with the reflections of her grandfather, Albert Gundawindi, as he was compiling his dictionary of Wiradjuri language, and with the confessional letters written by the German missionary, Ferdinand Greenleaf, as a third testimony to this harrowing story. This meditation on the importance of Aboriginal people's relationship to their land and of the words used to describe it is a monumental tale of personal and cultural survival, beautifully crafted and imagined. Winch has, in telling this story, cemented her reputation as one of Australia's most inventive, poetic and significant writers. We felt privileged to read such towering works of fiction and consider each of them to be quite masterful. And now to announce the winner of the Barbara Jeffress Award, please welcome Barbara Jeffress's grandson, Michael Little. Thank you, Robin, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm delighted to be here to make this announcement in honour of my grandmother, Barbara Jeffress. In describing this year's winning novel, the judges said, in a country riven by racial violence and social inequity, this brilliant novel demonstrates that catastrophes bring out the best and the worst in people and that lawless acts are sometimes necessary in order to save ourselves. The protagonist's sense of guilt as the mother of a resentful daughter and a dead son adds another resonance to this tale, which is founded on metaphors of mothering and of female choices and relationships. Offering hope for the future, this novel has tremendous contemporary relevance about the redemptive power of female intuition, resistance and resilience. The winner of the 2020 Barbara Jeffress Award is Lucy Trellor for Wolf Island. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful award. It is an incredible thrill and honour and a huge surprise to have been awarded it. Uh, thank you to the Barbara Jeffress Award judges and to the ASA. Um, so much appreciated. It was a great thrill and honour just to be shortlisted with these other fantastic authors. I adored all of these books. I'd like to uh, pay tribute to John Hind for leaving a bequest in his wife, Barbara Jefferis's name. He understood what many don't, that writers need time and they'd need money to buy that time. And this award will buy me the time to write my next book. In a strange way, I feel as if I've come full circle. It's 10 years since I was lucky enough to get an ASA mentorship. And at the time that made uh, an enormous difference to my confidence and to my feelings that writing was what I should be doing. I was on social media the other day and I came across someone who described herself as a rage fueled knitting fiend. And uh, I just thought, they're the people who are holding the world together. Wolf Island was fueled by my feeling that in a world falling apart, a person such as that might be the one who would make the difference. For women historically, uh, shelter, life itself, um, has always been provisional. And yet women make space for themselves and for the people around them and hold things together. And a prize that affirms what women do, what, what uh, female characters can do in a fiction, has never seemed more appropriate to me. If you're very lucky as a writer, you might have some people around you who make you feel that the work is possible and that you're up to the task. 
They make taking risks in your writing seem not ridiculous, but necessary and even wise sometimes. I count myself incredibly lucky in that regard. In particular, I'd like to thank my wonderful publisher, Matilda Imler, who has been a great support, Kate Patterson and everyone at Pan Macmillan who supported this project from the start. Paddy O'Reilly, who made invaluable suggestions during the draft phase, and my wonderful agent, Fiona Inglis. Uh, the Australia Council provided funding that supported the writing, and I also got a scholarship from the Trobe University. And these things together enabled that work and the uh, research trips to proceed, and it wouldn't have been possible without those. Arts funding and prizes make work possible and we need more of it, not less. And that's my plea for those things. The ASA is part of that extremely important ecosystem that makes Australia's writing culture such a rich and vibrant one. I'd like to thank them, the judges, and all the people at the ASA for their support of Australian writing. I am so, so grateful. Thank you once again for this amazing honour. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Lucy Trelaw's win of the 2020 Barbara Jeffress Award for her stunning work, Wolf Island. That brings us to the end of our online ceremony today. Thank you again to the judging panel, Dr. Robin Sheehan-Bright, Dr. Jeremy Fisher and Barbara Horgan. I'd also like to thank Michael Little for joining us for this special announcement, as well as the trustees of this generous prize, the Australian Society of Authors. Thank you for joining us. The Australian Society of Authors, promoting and protecting the interests of Australian authors and illustrators for over 50 years.